Gentlemen, dear people, welcome at the University of Amsterdam. Welcome in the Face Hofthuis. Welcome at the fourth biannual conference of CARP, the Research Lab for Character Assassination and Reputation Politics. I'm very glad that you can all be here, and also a hearty welcome to everyone whom I can't see but who will be joining us from cyberspace. So as many of you already know, we have been organizing these conferences every two years since 2017. Some of you have indeed already attended previous conferences. And the idea is to bring scholars from different fields together, put them all into one room, an actual room or a virtual room, and then hope that they start talking to each other. Because what we noticed when we started our work on character assassination is that there's actually many people in different fields working on this, but they speak in different academic languages, using different terms, looking at different things, and often not really talking to each other, even though it would probably be quite beneficial if they did so. So we have uh, rhetoricians working on ad hominem, we've got um, historians working on historical case studies, we've got political scientists working on so-called negative campaigning, and all of these things overlap, in a sense. And we think it's very interesting and fruitful to bring people together and have them exchange ideas about it. So that's what these conferences are all about, to forge networks, to bring people together. We also aim to be a very cross-cultural network. Um, we want to bring together people from very different cultural backgrounds, different countries. We have speakers from many different countries at this conference, uh, many different continents, even all with different backgrounds and different experiences. Now, it's our habit to always combine the topic character assassination with something else to give the conference a certain focus. In this case, we are collaborating with the Illiberalism Studies program, and the topic of the conference, as you all know, is character assassination, illiberalism, and the erosion of civic rights. My name is Martijn X. Many of you have corresponded me with me over the past few months, uh, but I haven't been doing all of this alone, even though it was probably usually my name that turned up at the end of emails. But as you can see, there's a lot of people involved in organizing all of this. Um, so first and foremost, Edwina Hagen uh, from Vught University, who has been involved in this project from the start, and my UVA colleague Alessandro Nai, who unfortunately can't be with us physically because he is in Japan, which I think is an excellent excuse. <laughs> Nevertheless, he's also been very engaged in organizing all of this. Uh, he came up with the QR codes, for instance. Yeah. We have, uh, as you know, several keynote speakers lined up. Tomorrow we have uh, Marlene Laruel, who is the head of the Illiberalism Studies program. We have uh, an evening event at SPO 25 with Simon Burroughs and Marisa Linton. And then we have a special guest of honor, Mr. Pavel Parashenko, whom we'll be hearing more of and about in a minute. So we're very grateful that all of you could be here and join us in this conference. I should also mention my CARP colleagues. Perhaps I should start with Sergei Samoylenko, who unfortunately, due to personal circumstances, also could not be present here in Amsterdam, but who has been instrumental in setting all of this up and forging the connection between character assassination and illiberalism. Uh, Eric Shuraev, from George Mason University and Jennifer Kjohain from the University of Baltimore, who uh, have been working on character assassination for years. 
And since I'm rattling off names, I guess I should also mention the sponsors who have generally, generously made this project possible. That would be my own research school, ASH, the Amsterdam School of Historical Studies, the Amsterdam School of Communication Research, CLU Plus, which is a program at VU University, and then of course both CARP and the Illibrism program have sponsored this as well. And you can already see that this is quite a diverse range of disciplines and logos that you see here. Uh, we have Alexander Koch from the University of Amsterdam sitting here at the front. Marijn Polignon here behind the, uh, the, the main desk, I guess. Boas Schrijver there in the corner, I hope. <laughs> you can all see him. And then we have uh, Tate Hagen. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. This, this is something uh, relatively new for me. I uh, prepared and I read some material on both character assassination and more broadly the liberalism. And I think that this is really going to be an extremely interesting conference because we are dealing, I think, with something that is still uh, growing. This is a trend. And um, looking at the list of papers to be prepared, it's extremely interesting to see that this uh, is something that people from many countries will cover. So it means that we are dealing with a global trend. And I think it will be perhaps the uh, conclusion that we will have to make after we have listened to all of those presentations and the panels today. Is this something that is here to stay? Or is it just one of those things that happen from time to time, one of those bells that sometimes ring and then it will gradually be vanishing? So is this a new novel? Hate speech, character assassination, derogatory language, debasing, debasement in uh, politics. I think this is a fascinating question that we will one day answer. So we are starting with this uh, CARP roundtable, character assassination and reputation uh, politics. Uh, with uh, very distinguished group of people who will be uh, speaking about their area of research and some of the conclusions that they have uh, drawn from uh, their studies. Uh, so there's me on the right. Um, uh, I study character assassination from the perspective of rhetoric and you know, my approach and focus tends to be historical as well. Um, I wrote my first book on the rhetoric of the Cold War when red baiting and, and character attacks were really prominent in the public sphere in the United States. Um, but nonetheless, um, as, as Martin mentioned, the, the rise of social media has made it infinitely easier, um, or what I like to say, it has democratized our ability to attack other people. Um, I know that there are a couple of other folks in the audience here today that also come at character assassination from a rhetorical perspective, but if that is not you, let me start by just uh, introducing and kind of defining my terms here and my approach to this study. Um, and again, we can go back to the ancient world here as well, to Aristotle, who defined rhetoric as the ability in any given case to see the available means of persuasion. And if you're a rhetorician, you probably just rolled your eyes at me for giving like the most basic definition of rhetoric there is. But the, the key idea is that rhetorical critics or rhetoricians study discourses or messages that are persuasive. And character attacks are often very persuasive, which is why they get used so frequently in political discourse. Um, and, and fundamentally, if, if rhetoric is about crafting a message designed to accomplish a goal with a particular audience, 
the essence of character attacks and character assassination is rhetorical. We attack people strategically uh, and we design attacks in order to lower their reputation in the public sphere, whether that's a very tightly constrained public sphere or whether that public sphere exists on the, the broader internet. So character assassination is fundamentally a communication transaction that's strategically communicated to an audience to accomplish a goal. Um, and if we have time, I can talk a little bit about some classical approaches to studying ad hominem attacks and how they differ from how I like to think about character assassination. Um, but one other thing that I'll just mention as well is uh, one of the other things that I'm really interested in untangling in my research is the way that gender has an impact on character attacks and that um, uh, gender and sexuality are fundamentally tied up with our expectations for appropriate behavior and therefore when people deviate from appropriate behavior, they open themselves up to, to character attacks pretty exceptionally. Um, so yes, old normal around for a while, new methods and new tricks make it easier to attack people. But fundamentally, you know, we're dealing with strategic messages and the tools at our disposal to craft those messages have certainly changed, but the power that they have to harm someone uh, is, if not constant, something that's been around for a very long time. Yeah, well, very interesting. In, in, in passing, let me just say you mentioned the gender, and it's interesting that uh, uh, in the middle stage of Perestroika, when the attacks on Perestroika started, they started with the attacks on Risa Gorbachev, uh, which was, I think, something definitely had a lot to do with character assassination because it was used strategically and because it contained lies and untruths. So it's, it, it was a, an interesting, a, a dramatic and unpleasant episode, but an interesting episode for uh, studying this uh, uh, whole phenomenon. Well, uh, I see that, you know, in terms of uh, gender, representation, everything is fine here today. <laughs> uh, no, no I, I, I mean it because uh, in, in my country, for example, in political science, uh, in arms control studies, which is what I'm doing, uh, the, there's been some improvement in this area, but, but not much, not, not a lot. Yeah, would you like to maybe pick up on some of the themes? Of, yeah, well, not necessarily. <laughs> no, on some of the themes about strategic yeah. use of uh, uh, well, uh, character assassination. There's so, so much. Uh, the gender. I think that's our next conference. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's, let's do it. <laughs> we'll leave it there. <laughs> that's, um, yeah. Uh, the, the, you were talking about well, we associate it with the heated political climate of uh, of our, our time. Um, and as a historian, I uh, am not so sure, of course, and I think one of the things that historians can contribute to the study of character assassination is the fact that we are good at or specialized in, in the source critique. And, and we, we know that um, the, uh, the every new communication te the technology uh, uh, brings new advantages uh, in, so um, and we specialize in primary sourcing the different kinds like pamphlets and, and speeches and sermons and we we know all the differences and all of the implications and the impact the different impact of all of those uh, forms of, of sources so um, that's i think that uh, historians are uh, of value to, to the study of uh, character assessment the long-term perspective and also the fact that we are very much aware of the changing meaning of concepts like character interpretation and um, character uh, like uh, character was very important uh, concept in the late 18th century uh, and, uh, the character um, referred to the moral dimension of uh, 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 traits of, of a person um, what I like especially about uh, working on character assassination is that it's a sort of 
it works as a mirror of uh, what what kind of traits were popular <laughs> and well accepted or were rejected at, at a certain uh, time. So that's that's one of the ways, and it's a gateway to to um, the, the, the political culture of a certain time. So it's it works like a perfect lens, and it's multidisciplinary as well. So yeah, that's. Yeah, that, that's extremely interesting. You, you said character, you know, the uh, word is borrowed from French, it was borrowed from French into Russian also, and it means basically uh, something very different. It means in Russian, basically your temperament, the kind of person you are, not necessarily right. from the moral standpoint. Yes. And so what you call character in, in, in Russian, directly translated back from Russian into English, would be moral face. It's a moral face your uh, moral person, so to say. And uh, of course, that's very different from uh, uh, the way the word character, which is character, is used in the uh, Russian language. Uh, I am looking at it, and uh, I'll be making a presentation about it from a linguistic standpoint. So I'm relatively new to it, and the person who introduced me to the whole area, character assassination, liberalism, is Eric Shiraev, and uh, I'd like to give you the floor. Well, thank you, thank you, Pavel. Well, sometimes I am, well, a couple of times I was asked, how did you come up with this idea, that's sort of an essay, you know? Uh, and I think uh, it started uh, my family, my parents, I was a little boy, and my parents were young professors that time, and they would talk about their job every day, you know, just blah, 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 just, just uh, just uh, the firing, hiring, promotion, just the uh, conferences, and uh, uh, and so I remember my father said, uh, "This guy, you know, uh, to my mom, uh, this guy uh, will not be promoted. In fact, just his career is finished." Uh, why? Well, you know, he's getting that going through a nasty divorce. And then I was ten, eleven. Wow! How does it fit uh, as a, a guy is associate professor or assistant professor who was probably? And now going through nasty divorce, does it affect his uh, scientific career? Apparently, that is association. Character assassination is, or character attack, is an attempt to attach your or my reputation to something uh, inappropriate, nasty, vulgar, in, uh, horrible, based on cultural rules, social rules, political rules. Um, simple example, this badge. I don't have this professional badge, and so professor, you talk about science and just you couldn't couldn't even just get yourself a normal badge. Kind of sounds like you're assassinated. Yeah, yeah that, character no, from that. Oh, 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 there we go. <laughs> and, yeah. and it started. It started. <laughs> or I can say somebody has having my badge and just pretending to be me. All well, accusations and then discussions. But you know exactly. Character assassination could be for real. Yes, guy going through nasty divorce. Maybe he was guilty. Maybe he was really, really obnoxious guy. So something happened and that was blown out of proportion uh, and attached to his reputation, no promotion, end of his career. Think about poor Salieri. He did not kill Mozart, but I asked my students who killed Mozart. Well, it's most likely Salieri. How it happened? Just made up information and then writers and composers and operas and ballet and everything else and the public member Salieri, well, huge huge section on Wikipedia about that he did not kill Mozart and just, just what did it, how did it start? It just it started in the 19th century and we, we traced, traced it. So allegations one thing, uh, things just as real, uh, exaggerated the second thing, but it's simple, simple, uh, simple slander, simple said you're a fool, you're an idiot. It's already enough to be qualified as a character attack and could be absolutely nothing if you have a thick skin and say, I don't care, I'm a good person, I'm not a fool. But there are other circumstances, and I hope we'll talk about them today and also during conference, uh, in which the simple, simple term, you're an idiot, can, can be meaningful and sometimes can start wars. Yeah, well, it's an amazingly uh, broad subject, and each of you has, uh, I think, added a little bit to our understanding of what it's all about. Uh, you mentioned, for example, that uh, just calling a person an idiot or some other bad, <coughs> bad name 
uh, could be the beginning of character assassination. And it is as, as a person who does American studies, it reminded me of a relatively recent uh, development in the US when uh, candidate Trump at that time, or yeah, candidate Trump uh, said a few bad derogatory things about Senator McCain. And he definitely meant uh, that this should be the beginning of a kind of avalanche. And indeed, you know, my own discussions with um, some uh, Republican friends in the US showed that, that indeed their opinion of McCain was to some extent undermined. They, they continued to be Republicans, moderate Republicans, most of them. Uh, but indeed, they started to think differently just because Trump said, well, a person should not be a prisoner of war. Yeah, yeah. he was coward. coward. He was coward, yeah. yeah. He, he, yeah. That's, that's coward, yeah. And the word was coward. Right. So uh, I think that uh, I'll allow myself to ask a couple of questions and then we'll turn it over to you. Uh, and, and the first question is, I've been to quite a few conferences, mostly in my area, linguistics, uh, some other arms control conferences, etc. And we always want uh, to have some kind of takeaway from each conference. So you've been studying this for several years. You've had some previous conferences. So what are some of the takeaways that you think were brought by those conferences, what are the, the achievements, I would say, that you can mention uh, that are the result of the studies, the conferences in which you've been engaged? Uh, Jennifer, you? I mean, there is one really concrete way to point to the fruit of the discussions that we've been having with some of you all for upwards of eight years now. Um, and that is, oh, sorry, <laughs> that's your phone, um, <laughs> a book, uh, and I know some of you in this room have chapters published in this uh, handbook, which was, um, I mean, there's like 40 chapters in here from a variety of disciplines that illuminate um, character assassination in a variety of contexts. Um, and so I think on a very concrete level, an outcome of the conversations that we've been having with you is putting scholarship into the world that, I mean, one of the things that I think is the biggest contribution of this particular book, um, other than the amazing cover, uh, is that it really illuminates that character assassination exists in every historical era and in every cultural context that we have looked at. I mean, I can't, without having studied infinite, uh, I can't say that for sure, but, um, you know, this book looks at character assassination in India all over the world, from the ancient world to social media and trolls and memes. Um, and so, one, I think, key takeaway is just the extensiveness of this phenomenon in our society, because when humans come together, they compete with each other, and character assassination is one key tool that they use to engage in that competition. Um, and so thanks all of you for bringing all of these great case studies to our attention and for sharing your research. Um, in, in this handbook, because that really, I think, shows this to be a fruitful area for scholarly inquiry from a variety of disciplines. Yeah. Well, would uh, any one of you like to add maybe to, to what Jennifer has told us? I can have, yeah, briefly. Right. Uh, one of the takeaways, I think one of many, it's uh, uh, my, uh, our uh, better understanding uh, not fine, but better understanding uh, of defenses against character attacks. Yeah. Uh, most people, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists working with the victims of bullying, uh, uh, political managers working with their candidates and others, 
uh, they rely most of, well, some research, but intuition uh, and, and facts. With, I think we have some uh, solid ideas as we develop further, further uh, about those defenses from bullying uh, to helping managers political campaigns and also corporate business. So essentially, it's, just, uh, it's important points. Uh, it's, uh, and so, again, uh, the defenses is what what uh, we're trying to explain better and also uh, try, try just using using other people's research and see whether, uh, whether they're effective. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'll again along with uh, one final question and then you'll be asking your uh, questions. So my second question is the subject of this particular conference is character assassination and illiberalism. And the question is, uh, how do you perceive this particular aspect of character assassination? Can we say that it is specific more to the liberal regimes, or maybe it's specific and typical of regimes that are societies, uh, politics that are basically democratic, but that are experiencing significant problems during some stage of their development. How do we uh, distinguish between liberal regimes and uh, maybe immature democracies or something uh, like this? Uh, Martin, could I perhaps give you a try first to, to, to answer this question? Yes. Um, of course, I'm not an expert in illiberalism, and I think one of the things we'll probably be talking about during these days is what, what exactly we mean when we use that word. <coughs> Marlene Lauel has written a very enlightening paper that we sent round that helps define what illiberalism is. And in her terms, it's, it's a reaction of discontent against liberalism. Uh, and I think indeed in democratic societies, you can already have many character attacks. Um, my gut feeling is that what perhaps you get more of in illiberal regimes than in, let's say, a regular democracy is that the government itself launches character attacks against dissidents and scapegoats. And then I think about uh, Navalny in Russia, I think about uh, Erdogan and Gulen, uh, I think about Soros and uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, of course. Uh, so opponents of the regime, or people who are perceived to be opponents of the regime, are attacked by the government itself. Uh, so it's what we call top-down attacks, where two parties in a character attack are not evenly matched, but one has a lot more resources and power at its disposal than the other. And um, without having studied this myself, uh, my impression is, is that this is something that you typically get more of in liberal regimes, than in, uh, for instance, uh, Western European democracies. Mm -hmm. But again, you mentioned, for example, Orban, and uh, he's certainly a person who uh, personally is not a liberal. Right. Whether you can actually say that, that Hungary is an illiberal regime, I'm not sure. So mm -hmm. maybe someone would like to add or respond to uh, some of the examples, actually, that uh, uh, Martin gave. So I also am not an expert in liberalism, um, but I, I, I want to say I think three three quick things. Um, the first is that you know rhetorical critics, as they analyze discourse, must pay careful attention to the context in which it occurs, and we can define context broadly: socio-political, economic, um, cultural, and so certainly when we study regimes that we might consider illiberal, um, you know, we, we really have to pay attention to the context. Are people who are attacked um, able to respond in any way in a, a meaningful public sphere? Um, and so, so paying attention to the, the nuances of the context, um, I think, would require a rhetorical critic to pay attention to the, the power that underlies that regime, which leads to the, the second quick point, of course, is that uh, rhetorical critics are interested in studying power, um, as lots of other people are. I'm not saying we're the only people that do that. but um, And so one thing I was going to bring up is what Martin already said, which is that in, in our work on, on character assassination, we've distinguished between 
horizontal and vertical attacks, um, such as whether the, the person who is being attacked has a similar level of power access to resources to defend their name. Um, and so obviously in a liberal regime would condition um, where the, the power plays lie um, between the attacker and the target. Um, and it requires you to think about who is the public for this rhetoric. Um, uh, just as a quick point to, to Orban, um, the only reason I'm bringing this up, I don't really want to get into a definitional quabble, but there, I, the reason I bring this up is because I just read a really great article by uh, Svilin Trifonov at the University of Georgia analyzing Orban's rhetoric as, as rhetoric of illiberal democracy. And um, his argument looking at, at Orban was that there are sort of uh, intertwining narratives of both a, na uh, a nation in ascent and a nation in peril that are kind of creating this audience for an illiberal democracy. So if you're interested in looking more at Orban from a rhetorical perspective, um, I would highly recommend you check out that paper. It's really well argued. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I think the uh, point about context is really very important. Uh, unless anyone, Eric, you, do you want to add something to this question and then I'll give it over to you? Yeah, we talked a lot, maybe just do some discussion. Okay, <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm turning to the audience and um, I'm sure at least some of you have questions, so let's... Uh, or comments. Or, or comments, yes, absolutely. Let's go for it. Who, who, will, who would like to be the first? Yes, please. So, because India was mentioned, I want to Start. Uh, so I'm from India. Um, I'm a political scientist. My name is Sushmita. Um, and uh, I will work on populism in India, looking at the long term historical trajectory of how populism has changed over time mm -hmm. with respect to the coming of democracy in India, so from colonial to post colonial times, uh, with the coming of media and uh, uh, the changing nature of nationalism. So, uh, in that respect, I um, came across this conference. So I have like a couple of questions. First, regarding character assassination um, that Eric and Jennifer were talking about and the words that you guys used were nasty, fool, idiot, right? Uh, for slander. And I was wondering, because what's happening in India, and I'm sure it's happening in other parts of the world also with regard to gender specifically, where character assassination is not negative words, but very positive attributions. This woman is too hardworking, you know. Um, so similarly in India, you know, a very positive thing, uh, words that you would attribute like a positive are used in a negative manner, right? And I was wondering if you take that kind of characteristic assassination into account, and how would you fit that in terms of rhetoric and character assassination? Uh, so that's my question to both Eric and Jennifer. And my uh, other question to Edwina is. Um, you talked about changing meaning of concepts, right? Um, and I was wondering, yeah, our conceptual history does a great job in that, because um, conceptual historians. I was wondering, how much does a concept like character assassination change so much that we cannot really go back to the roots anymore? In the sense, it has changed so much, you know, with the coming of social media today, what character assassination is today is. Yes, there are some uh, basic uh, similarities that we can offer, but it has changed so much over time, you know, that they are not the same monsters. They are two different monsters. So I was wondering if you can say how a historian thinks about this kind of completely changed concept with having some roots to it. So the yeah, ideas of translation. Okay, so two questions, and uh, uh, whoever would like to start, please. I, I can start. Yeah. I fully agree with you. <laughs> it changed a lot. We have a conceptual uh, historian there. But um, uh, no, it's, um, it's true that it's. Well, um, uh, I did uh, some case studies um, on the 18th century. And um, what struck me was that, I mean, uh, uh, character, a man of character in the 18th century is a man of virtue. And um, so, and it goes back to the uh, classical Republican uh, ideals. 
And uh, so when they were attacking uh, politicians, um, it was more about the, uh, the, that the, fa the fact that they weren't living up to the standards they uh, were setting them for themselves. So, um, but it wasn't really, nowadays we think, oh, it's, you, uh, the attack is meant to attack the person behind the public face. Um, but it was in those days, that's my impression at least. So I was wondering, character association doesn't really exist in the 18th century because it's about uh, attacking a public uh, figure and a public, uh, it's, a, it's a front that you only uh, attack. Uh, on the other hand, I think there is, uh, if you look at the 18th century, uh, there is a similarity that uh, we still want our politicians to live up to their own uh, ideals, to, to, to what, they, what they say and what they do has to be the same. Integrity is still a virtue. So there are similar traits still that we still value and that they were valued at the time. So you have to really um, uh, work in a very detailed way and analyze it very carefully and then you will find so, uh, similarities and differences uh, over time. So it's, yes, it did change an awful lot, but not, not entirely. I mean, it's not completely different, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, still. Yeah, thank you, Sabrina. Yeah. yeah, if I can add a bit to that before I give the floor to Eric and, and Jenny. Uh, you're perfectly right, of course. Um, this is something we're always struggling with, and it's not just true in case of history, but also when you are comparing different cultures. We already heard that the word character has a very different meaning in Russia. So the, the challenge that we face, but what we also at the same time think is very important, is to try and come up with a language that allows us to speak to each other from different countries, from different disciplines, from different historical perspectives, and yet still look at the things that are similar as well. So what we try to do is distinguish between what we call some central features of character assassination, which, uh, for instance, include the so-called five pillars. There is always an attacking party. There's always a target. There's always an intended audience. There's always a medium. And it always takes place in a certain context. So those five things, as variable as each of those may be, uh, give you a, a sort of tool that you can use for different periods. And then on the other hand, you have the, what we call the peripheral features, which are uh, culture-specific, uh, technology-specific, uh, etc., etc. And they change from one society to the next. So it has changed, but not changed totally. <laughs> not totally. Um, Eric, uh, the, the first question, I, I, I think, was um, Again, this is this is something that you perhaps might be yeah, challenge. Yeah. Uh, yes, certainly, it's not necessarily about slander or bad words uh, or or blaming somebody. Uh, an example, maybe will be in unison with the uh, example you gave us uh, uh, from India. Uh, so, elections in in Moldova a couple of years ago, I was somehow was was participating and observing. Uh, uh, one of the uh, significant campaigns against. Uh, uh, Maria Sandu, she is female, uh, she became president. Uh, the, was the fact that the opposition said, basically saying that on television, newspapers, radio, the web, well, well, she is hardworking. However, she could not manage her own family. She is not married. How can she manage the country if she couldn't manage her own family? And that was it. Was a difficult, was a difficult defense against her because so many people said, "Oh yeah, that's that's that's." A woman supposed to be married and manage the family, and then maybe, maybe, maybe someday. So that's that's. It's not. It's really nasty, but it's really superstitiously done. Yeah, I mean, I would I would just add quickly that you're absolutely right that we we have to understand contextually how these concepts, whether it's things like being caring or hardworking, are used um, for a particular audience. Um, Certainly, uh, as, as Eric pointed out, and as, as you brought up as well, uh, women seeking traditional forms of power, whether it's in the boardroom or in politics, 
face what scholars have called a double bind between competence and femininity. Um, and folks like Karen Anderson and, and Carlin Course Campbell have written about that from a rhetorical perspective. But the more that you perform what are traditionally seen to be feminine traits like caring, being other directed, and, and, and these are things that we like, right? That we think women should do. But the more that you perform those traits, uh, the more you demonstrate yourself not to be a decisive, aggressive leader of the kind that we would want in the boardroom or, you know, behind the podium giving press conferences as president. But, um, but I think you're, you're certainly right that positive concepts can be presented negatively when we uh, dig deep into the, the context. Okay, uh, thank you. Please, sir. Yeah, first of all, thank you for organizing this. I, I can't help myself, but I keep reading that first sentence. Um, I <laughs> yes, sentence. Uh, if, if I might suggest a slight change. Sure, yeah. You keep talking about rhetorics and about the way uh, words are used in order to defame someone. But what about the attacks on words itself? So if you read character texts of assaults aimed at a particular word or concept, if you like, and the goal is to subtly, very subtly, gradually change the meaning of the word. Why don't we include this? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm sure you, you know Victor Klumpers and, and, and LTI, the lingua tertia imperium. Klemper is the brother of the, um, of the, of the, of the conductor. He, he was a Jewish professor and the Nazis threw him out. So he couldn't work. And as a linguist, he started to very maliciously um, write down what happened with words. And in this book, The Language of the Third Empire, the Third uh, Tender Empire, he, he gradually describes how common words very, very gradually changed until they had a complete other meaning, the meaning that the Nazis wanted them to have. Isn't that a form of character yeah. assassination? Absolutely. Um, I'm reminded um, in, in a Dutch context of the, the word uh, Deuven, yeah. uh, perhaps a bleeding heart, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. being a bleeding which used to be, at least in the Dutch context, I don't know about bleeding heart, but in the Dutch context, it used to be a positive thing. You want to be a good person, that's what it meant. But by now, it's become basically an accusation of hypocrisy, and ostentatiously displaying yes. what a virtuous person you are, then you are a, a dover. But it's, the assumption is that this is insincere. That's not what the word originally meant. So that word has been undermined, as it were. And people who try to be virtuous and display virtue, uh, this can now be subtly questioned by just putting the tag uh, "dover" you know, and "dovements" on someone. But in, in U.S., basically, yes, it's a slice, well, it's a derogatory term referring to Democrats, dinosaurs, Republicans, and bleeding hearts, the Democrats, both this. So just don't use it. <laughs> yeah. We are, we are told. We are told. Um, I mean, I think. I, I, certainly, we've already talked about the way that concepts shift in meaning contextually and that historians and, and all sorts of critics and analysts need to pay attention to the shift in meaning. Um, and I think it's a, a great point that as words shift meaning, they can be, be, become tools for character assassination in ways that they weren't before. Um, that said, I, I, I wouldn't say that the word itself has been character assassinated because the word doesn't have a character, right? Words don't have character. They have meanings, but those aren't the same thing. Okay, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about this in my presentation, so you might find it interesting. But thank you for mentioning Klumperich's book. Uh, has been translated into Russian. Uh, people know him, and uh, you know, as I've been thinking about how best to translate into uh, Russian character assassination, you know, I came up with the equivalent of moral destruction, mm -hmm. and this is something like uh, conceptual destruction, the destruction of a concept, the destruction of a word. Uh, for example, the word liberal has been uh, damaged 
significantly. The word intelligentsia in Russian has been damaged significantly over the past 15, 20 years. So it's, it's an interesting thing to discuss. Yes, your question, please. Yeah, I, uh, we were talking about the liberalism and character assassination in the liberal countries, but uh, uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on this. Um, in this country, we have a situation in which people follow conspiracy theories tend to assassinate the characters of mostly left-wing female politicians. And there's not so much a, a power difference there, but they tend to be able to create an image that sticks. And now everyone is calling our Minister of Finance, for example, a witch, mm. which started somewhere in the, in the, in the dark corners of the internet. But, uh, and, and, and those people, the people that are doing that are mostly anonymous, or, and there's no power difference there. So that's one question, and if I may, a second short question of clarification. I, I was wondering whether character assassination always has to be um, slander, bad. I mean, is, is, is revealing someone's bad reputation also assassination? Because you destroy someone's persona, but it's true. You know, take Michael Jackson, for example, just to name someone. Yeah. Those two questions I would like to ask. I could say something about the second one, and then you can, uh, you can go for the other one. Um, so, uh, we use the word character assassination, and it has one big advantage and one big disadvantage. And uh, the, the advantage and the disadvantage are that this is a, a word that is colloquially used by people in everyday speech. Advantage is that it makes it instantly recognizable. That's why we use the word, because when people Google or look something up, they, we want them to find us. So there's a very good reason for doing so. The disadvantage is that people also have some assumptions when they hear this word, which is not necessarily the way we are using it. So contrary to the everyday use of the word character assassination, uh, we try to look at it from a neutral academic perspective. That's perhaps a very important point to make. So we're not saying this is a good attack, or this is a bad attack, or oh, this one was justified, so we'll not call it character assassination, this one's unjustified, because then you constantly have to take a political stance on every issue and, and determine what's justified, what you find unjustified. So rather than getting embroiled in that, what we look uh, at is a form of, as Jenny says, strategic communication, where the very basic fact is that one person or entity tries to damage the reputation or the image of another. And using the method of exposing, which we list as one of several categories of character assassination, is definitely one. Sometimes people are being exposed for something they actually did. That can still be character assassination. It's no longer true today, I think, but if in the 1950s or 1960s an American presidential candidate would be having an affair, like the Gary Hart case, for example, um, and the opposition would find out about that and publish that. And it, it would be true, but it would still be done with the intent to destroy his character and put him out of the political race. Um, anyone else would like to perhaps comment on uh, your two questions? Very quick, 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 quick. Uh, and I, I hope in the future we will uh, follow this my humble uh, recommendation that uh, illiberalism is a continuum. Uh, and uh, even the most liberal city in Amsterdam has elements of illiberalism. <laughs> and illiberal regimes do have uh, often represent examples of, of liberal uh, elements or, or, or uh, events or, or happenings. So that's why we need to see this, this definitely, definitely. So it is not, there's no absolutely illiberal countries and a country that's liberal. It's always a continuum. And we must probably just see where, where we stand when we discuss things. One thing, for example, say, Amsterdam or say Alabama in the United States. Well, well, both capitalist countries, however, it's the state of liberalism in Alabama is lower. Well, Amsterdam, you'll judge. Okay. Uh, you wanted to ask a question? Uh, yes. Thank you so much for organizing this very interesting uh, conference. It's the first time I'm participating in this conference. I'm very, very curious about and it's very promising. I mean, uh, uh, the first uh, first discussion that we were engaged in, and it, it looks very, very interesting. And I wonder if you would like to comment something on the connection. I mean, 
I'm tired of, of, uh, of the far right extremism from a, from a gender perspective. And what I found very interesting is exactly that connection between what you are theoretically naming as character assassination, but what I would also see as uh, a proliferation of violent language on, on digital environments, particularly by uh, far right and extreme right actors. And I wonder how, how would you put the two concepts together? So on the one hand, let's say symbolic violence, yes, if it stays only at that level, but also this issue of character assassination, how these things can very easily be replicated by physical violence. Mm. Yeah, a very interesting question. You used the term for a word combination symbolic violence. Are you sure? Maybe it's just verbal violence. It's not symbolic once uh, the, the, the words that are used are violent. But anyway, it's, it's an interesting question. Please. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that I have a, a good answer for it, other than I think that all of the things that you are observing are true. <laughs> that, um, you know, that weaponized language flourishes especially strongly in particular online spaces. And someone else mentioned um, anonymity. You know, you don't have to be a psychologist to notice that when people have their names taken away from accountability for their words, that uh, the, you know, we go from zero to 100 really, really quickly. Um, you know, I also think, too, um, that if we look at it even just from a legal perspective, and I'm thinking of Supreme Court decisions here in the United States, uh, sorry, here, comma, in the United States, um, that the recognition that there are very real implications for what words do has been um, certainly recognized and you know the impacts of character assassination even if character assassination only um, comes in words are material right people lose book contracts they lose jobs they lose friends um, and so in some ways um, I one I mean I think I mean, I think what I guess I want to say is I, I want us to recognize um, the rhetorical world is deeply intertwined with the material world, right? That to draw too big of a distinction between the words and um, the way that the, wor the words play out materially um, might do us a, a disservice. Uh, but certainly more directly to the heart of your question about um, both like the gendered spaces and the way that um, particularly gendered, weaponized language flourishes on the far right. Um, I think your your observations are right, at least in the context that I've looked at it in. Very quickly, maybe a borderline case, but uh, probably you know here about ongoing a saga with uh, one of America's biggest beer companies. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, 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 Bush, I guess, they decided to use a transgender person uh, to promote a Bud Light. Uh, it's a Bud Light is the cheapest uh, brand of beer. You just sold billions of, of cans for every year. Uh, and the, the point is, can uh, they or people uh, character assassinate corporations? It's not about that. Uh, the attacks were against her. Say, so, oh, if she drinks beer, I quit. The company lost 25% of, of, of stock. It's a disaster. That's material, to, just to example. There you go. So one person is just drinking beer, it's, it just she was attacked to Brick well, this is I can't even even say what was this there. And that company lost 25% stuff. Yeah, it's interesting that the attack came not from the far right, but just from the yeah. right. Yeah. You know, and, and it means that it evokes uh, certain feelings on the part of people who are not extremists. So uh, the company probably you know, in the particular context of the US, made a mistake, went too far too soon, perhaps. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, my impression also is that there is more rhetoric of this kind, not necessarily violent rhetoric, but right now on the right than on the left. But you have to be careful, you know, uh, whatever, you know, the 
pace of change today everywhere is very fast, but probably the uh, company thought that it was faster than it really was. And that's why uh, quite a few people, 25%, or I don't know how, how many, uh, thought that, well, we don't go that fast. That, that's my impression. Well, uh, before we wrap it up, I, I do want to give another person, one more person, a chance. And it's difficult. Well, maybe I'll ask you to ask the last question, and you will reserve for my presentation. Okay? The others who will not give yeah. give the chance. Okay. I'm sorry, but you know we are time limited. Please, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm really interested. You brought out about night because if you could look at um, it's not my question. It's about that, but I'm just getting that in there. Um, if you look at um, all the shoes Nike. They also did something like that, but then they bounced back because they stuck to their guns. And actually, they're, you know, because it's all the economy here, yeah, their uh, profits are up like quite a few percentages because they stuck to it. Mm. So I think the problem with um, Bud might be, I mean, the Americans will know this, but they're a bit mushy washy. They're like, they were going and then they kind of fall back. And anyway, the polarization in the US seems to be unacceptable. But now my question. <laughs> Um, Mark, then you uh, said, oh, yes, this is, uh, social media has been good because uh, look, it's, there's a lot more engagement. And of course, because I do social media, I had to uh, jump on that because, you know, of course, I'm going to suggest, well, what are your thoughts on this? Should we critically um, consider what the, uh, what the real contribution of social media is to character assassination and to a liberalism? Because if we start to look at the quality of engagement that we have online, we actually, you know, can worryingly start to see that it's not just, for example, the far right who has no, you know, where there's no competition of ideas, but also well-meant initiatives like for social justice, uh, where we see um, council culture, where everyone jumps down the throat of someone who's been racist on the video, or even, you know, um, people who are, you know, uh, making these kinds of symbolic gestures like cutting off hair for the women in Iran and so forth and so forth. Um, so what is liberal about it is that actually in cancel culture, for example, everyone saying, oh, we can't have that. They never say what that is, especially. It's just a big outpouring of, how will this really uh, fix something that you said, of showing your own morality. So the moral face, you mentioned this. And so to iterate my question, do you think actually social media might be helping character attacks, you know, might be enabling them, and shouldn't we therefore be a bit critical about the contribution that social media is? Yeah. Um, let me say up front that if I use the word good, then I should immediately qualify that. I'm not actually that sure how good social media No, you just said are. more engagement. But there is more engagement, yeah, <laughs> I, do, I do stand by that. Um, and that means more people, of course, get a platform, and it also means more people get a public image. That's the other side of it. It's not just the, the fact that you can attack someone, but you're also exposed to more attacks, and it becomes more important to have a good, virtuous public image. I think the trend I mentioned earlier about the, the, the Dutch word Dogen, uh, having this evolution and, and now often meaning being basically being a poseur who poses virtue has a lot to do with that as well because we, we think in terms of images and creating images and then we assume that it's all just image making and that there's not, nothing real behind it and that if I uh, profile myself as a virtuous person on Twitter uh, I'm, I'm just posing I'm not actually being virtuous I'm just saying that I am and from an historical perspective and, and perhaps that we know can add to that. I think this is something that you see happening through time, uh, time and time again. Uh, more and more people get a platform, get a space in the public sphere. Of course, that happened with the introduction of the internet. It happened with uh, newspapers. It happened with the introduction of the printing press. It gives a voice to groups uh, who were marginal before that. And, and the playing field widens and widens. And yes, that means it enables character attacks, inevitably, I think. Just look at the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther and, and everything that he printed. And then look at uh, all the pamphlets they print in, in the 18th century, which I'm sure we'll be hearing more about as well. 
more and more people can play this game. Uh, and that's certainly the case with Twitter, you know, that basically everything has, everyone has a megaphone. Um, so personally, I, I, I think it's important that we, we start thinking more carefully about how to regulate this. You know, there, there are some steps being taken in that direction, uh, but it's a very complicated issue. But I think it's one of several paradigm shifts that we've seen throughout history where there's a new technology or a new medium is introduced and it creates a new platform uh, and also enables character attacks. It also enables good things. Okay, thank you. Anything you'd like to add? Do you know no, no, I fully yeah. agree. Yeah. And I yeah. think yeah, the recording. difference is, is, is that it, it enables attackers and it enables people, it gives people agency to repolish and redefine their public identities mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it works both ways, I think. I don't, I don't think in terms of positive or negative. Yeah. Or I think that there is, yeah, there are people nowadays have more. Uh, options to uh, to uh, uh, profile themselves in a certain way than uh, in in, uh, in early times. Okay, well, um, I'm told that we need to wrap it up. So thank you very much, the panelists, for contributing, all of you, and thank you very much, our other participants, for really participating, for your attention, and for your questions. Thank you. Well, there are people in the world who witness history and people who make history, and there are people who both witness, make, and more, analyze, describe, and interpret history. Pavel Palashenko is not only interpreter, but he's also interpreter of history. He's an analyst, writer. Uh, he is a person who seen them all. He uh, worked with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. He translated uh, Ronald Reagan, David Thatcher. He uh, is a specialist uh, in many fields of linguistic and uh, art and science and translation. And also, just recently, I'm very proud that survival said, well, probably I will just consider maybe doing something in fields of character assassination. Subject very interesting. So uh, we will make it informal. It will be a, a presentation, but so I'll make sure that we interact and we ask questions, because I think many questions are still there and we want to ask them. Uh, to make uh, my uh, long interaction shorter, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce you to Pavel Palashenko, uh, an interpreter, writer, scholar, and a wonderful person. So, we'll go to the first slide. And uh, that's the title of my presentation. Uh, uh, just click. Yeah, just. Oh, it's the the liberal politics, that's the, that's the first thing. Yeah. So uh, the title of my presentation just shows you that I come to this from mostly a linguistic perspective, and um, I think that, that would be my contribution. Uh, next slide. Uh, the next slide is... Uh, something that I think I learned as I was preparing for this presentation, and this is not linguistic, this is more like socio-political, and I think that broken taboos is something that we have seen in many, many countries, including some established democracies. Verbal aggression, verbal violence, it's uh, to pick up something from the previous panel, it's not symbolic, it's, it's real. And it can go from verbal to non-verbal. The coarsening of political discourse, humiliating rhetoric, contemptuous labels, nicknames, all of this is used strategically, as was mentioned, indeed uh, emphasized in the previous panel. And it's used strategically because it works. The next slide is where? As I said, it is used in democratic countries by illiberal leaders, by liberal politicians. It's used in problematic democracies and electoral autocracies by the leaders themselves. And less often, actually, it is used in totalitarian countries and totally totalitarian countries because I think that their leaders do not particularly need this tool. And mostly it is used in domestic 
politics, but it is seeping gradually, but very substantially into international politics. The next slide, why does it work? Well, this was mentioned in the previous panel. It works because the social media and Twitter culture made hate speech and uncivil language less unacceptable. We tend to be looser in social media, all of us. Looser tongues prevail in social media. Also because there is political polarization in many countries and it activates, it, it triggers the participation of previously not interested people, uninterested people to whom such language appears. And of course, the media often rewards the, uh, this kind of language and this kind of politicians and leaders by disproportionate coverage. Uh, and uh, then to my actual topic, what are the problems of understanding and translation that this uh, trend, this very strong trend, uh, leads to? Uh, well, first of all, the problems appear because derogatory language is often culture specific and there are people like journalists, commentators, translators, who act as social mediators. And they're not always perfect social mediators. They're not always aware of the nuances of media and usage and not always aware of how these meanings and how this usage can play in a different culture. And also, of course, because the vocabulary, the words used for the basement humiliation, etc., often have no equivalent in other languages. So the next slide, let me give you a Russian example. Uh, the, the trend that's been obvious in the Russian language and Russian speech, and there is a difference between language and speech. Language is all the resources, grammatical, lexical, and others, that is provided by Russian, English, and other languages. Speech is how those resources are used, the frequency of the use of those resources. So recently in the Russian speech, there's been frequent use of allusions to obscene vocabulary in the discussion of political issues. So the ostensible, the, the, the word that is used is not in and of itself uh, um, uh, obscene. For example, in, in Russian, the verb to row uh, is used very often as uh, a euphemism for the F word. And so, uh, particularly um, as uh, uh, a uh, past participle, and everyone knows what is meant by it is used. Uh, some other words, those who are familiar with the Russian language will recognize uh, these words. They are actually uh, quote unquote euphemisms, but not really euphemisms because they are used in order to make a specific allusion at an obscene word. And uh, in the Russian language, there are more obscenities than in many other languages. And so politicians don't use them, but they allude to them. And so those obscenities are more numerous. They are dirtier than in most other languages. And so the use of such allusions is often really not harmless, but they are not immediately recognized by what I call cultural mediators, journalists, interpreters, etc. And this, of course, is particularly difficult in my specific area, and that is simultaneous interpretation, because they are often unanticipated. And anticipation, and what is called scientifically probability anticipation, that is, you anticipate on the basis of how probable you think uh, something is going to be when, when uttered in a few seconds. So you basically, on the basis of this uh, probability anticipation, uh, think that something is likely to be said. And sometimes things that are said by speakers are extremely unlikely. And very often things, words that are used for 
character assassination, for harming and damaging the reputation of people are totally unanticipated by interpreters. Well, this is an example from 2002 when Vladimir Putin was, uh, uh, I, I would say, a, a beginner president of Russia, but he definitely uh, used many of the uh, tricks and uh, methods that one might uh, refer to as belonging to the sphere of character assassination. Uh, I will not quote it because you see it on uh, uh, the screen. And what he said was definitely aimed at, at shocking uh, the audience. Uh, it was an improvisation, so I don't think that it was something that he came to the press conference with uh, as a prepared uh, uh, kind of utterance. No, I don't think so. But he was very upset with the question that the French reporter asked. And uh, he said uh, something that was totally unanticipated, totally unanticipated by the interpreter. And uh, um, as uh, reporters, uh, uh, from Commerçant and uh, uh, other Western uh, news agency and some, some Western news agency uh, saw this was probably not understood by most of the audience who were not Russian speakers and who were not familiar with the Russian language. As the Associated Press reported, the exact meaning of Putin's words was not immediately understood due to the Intermittent translation. Well, intermittent translation, I think that's a very charitable uh, uh, explanation of what actually happened. Uh, the interpreter was totally lost. He lost the speaker. And it was only the next day that the Associated Press uh, uh, provided uh, the translation from the uh, but is it duty, uh, sorry interrupting you, but is it a duty of a translator to, to translate exactly or you know, this right not yeah. to yeah. in well, this case? Well, my advice to younger interpreters is that you can neutralize a little bit. You can make it stylistically a little less offensive. You actually do it, particularly younger colleagues, they actually do it because their vocabulary is not quote unquote rich enough to, to, to do it. Uh, in, in a way that is as aggressive as in the original. Um, but you should never, you, you can neutralize, you can soften it a little bit, particularly if you don't have uh, the exact uh, words in your repertoire, so to say. But you should never make it more aggressive. You should never exaggerate even more and uh, make it even more aggressive because then, uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I do think that in this case, it was not, it, it's the duty of the interpreter to uh, interpret the way it was said, both from the point of view of substance and from the point of view of form. But you can sometimes sacrifice some of the form make it a little less uh, aggressive, uh, but certainly not more uh, aggressive. But the most important duty of the interpreter is definitely to convey the substance and to convey at least some of the style. Um, well, um, uh, then of course there is also something that uh, uh, cultural mediators do not always uh, uh, capture, and that is the nuance in mislabeling. For example, in the United States, the uh, uh, Republicans have recently started to say, instead of China or the Chinese People's Republic, which is the official name of the country, they say the Chinese Communist Party. There is an example that you see on the screen. And uh, this is actually derogatory. It is, uh, but very often uh, this is missed by journalists, by uh, cultural uh, mediators, by interpreters, 
I think it should be, definitely should be reflected in the uh, translation. Very often they just say China, and that is not correct. You know, you should be attentive to that kind of things. And of course, always uh, also the Republican practice of calling the Democratic Party the Democrat. Why do they do that? Well, because crat is a, a word for that is often used in derogatory words such as plutocrat, bureaucrat. So they say the Democrat Party. And uh, uh, this is something that not only continues, but um, according to the Associated Press, it's on the rise. I think that that too should be in some way reflected in the uh, uh, translation. How that's the challenge for interpreters, that's the challenge for uh, uh, the mediators. Uh, the word liberal, uh, the word progressive, may be used and is used as derogatory words. Uh, I have given some examples on the uh, slide, and <clears throat> it is indeed true that very often today in the US, uh, the word liberal has uh, been used in a uh, derogatory way or in a negative uh, context. A lot less so in Europe, but it is seeping into the uh, political discourse in uh, European countries, certainly in uh, Great Britain, perhaps, and in some other countries as well. Uh, I uh, have given the example, the last example on this slide is from, uh, uh, I think, an interview by the former Attorney General under President uh, Trump. Uh, Attorney General Barr, and he said that the greatest threat to the country is the progressive agenda. Well, progressive agenda taken out of context, there is nothing derogatory uh, about this, but the way he uses it makes it uh, negative. So what do you do in, in uh, translation? It's, that's or that's uh, in uh, discussing it, for example, in an article by a journalist or commentator. One possibility is to use, that works quite well in Russian, to put it in inverted commas. Another possibility is to use the word so-called. But each time a perfectly normal word is used in a derogatory way, you have to be alert to that, and you have to take it into account in interpretation or uh, translation. Uh, take the word liberal in Russian. It's, it's the same word, liberal. But historically, not just recently, after the uh, what many call failure of Russian reforms, this word has been used in our country mostly in a negative way. But historically, even before the uh, Russian Revolution in 1917, in the late imperial period, it was mostly used in a derogatory way, both the political meaning of that word and uh, the uh, non-political meaning. For example, in one of uh, uh, the Soviet dictionaries, a very good dictionary by Ozhigov, uh, that was the definition in, uh, that's, that's the uh, third sentence, the definition of the word liberal, not just, you know, necessarily, you know, in a Soviet, uh, dictionary, uh, you, you have to reflect the political ideology of the time. But even in the non-political uh, sense, you can see definition number two, excessive tolerance, leniency, or indulgence. And examples given by that dictionary are interesting. They put a rotten liberalism, a rotten liberalism in evaluating students' knowledge. I'm giving you uh, actually the rough translation of the exact definition in that uh, uh, dictionary. And of course, today, in post-Soviet Russia, uh, there's been this uh, rather terrible word. I mean, uh, Martin said we shouldn't evaluate, but I think it's a rather terrible word, the word liberaste. It's a conflation, uh, exploiting the very widespread anti-gay attitudes. The Russian society, uh, a completion 
two words that immediately you know, shows you that for many people in my country, liberalism is a dirty word. And of course, sometimes it's just meaningless. Uh, uh, Vladimir Zhirinovsky political party, which was created in the final years and months of the Soviet Union, is called Liberal Democratic Party, which it is not, it's neither liberal nor democratic. Uh, the word that has been on everyone's lips in the United States, the word woke, has no equivalent in other languages. And the thing is that uh, it is very difficult to borrow into uh, uh, the Russian language and into many other languages. And as we all know, the words that are easy to borrow are mostly from the Greek and Latin origin. That's easy to borrow. 50% uh, of English vocabularies borrowed during the Norman conquest when uh, the entire British court was uh, you know, the royal court was speaking French rather than English. Uh, so uh, um, generally those words are easy to borrow, but the word woke, you cannot just borrow it into, the, into most languages. Although Russians living in the United States are already using that word. On woke, wokeism, they use the word wokeism or wokeism. So, they do, but no one will understand whether what it means. And it's interesting that uh, uh, it's in you know as I follow uh, American uh, discussions of political issues, I see that at least to me it's mostly used negatively by DeSantis, for example. Uh, uh, it's uh, used. Its uh, derivatives, such as wokeism or wokeness, are also used mostly in a derogatory way. But I was really surprised uh, that uh, for quite a few people, there is nothing negative about this word. Uh, 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 well, the fact that former President Trump uh, does not quite understand what the word means, I think. That is the same with many people abroad. So how do you interpret that word? How do you translate that word when it is used? And uh, to me, it was extremely surprising that a poll, a recent poll, was like four or five months ago, uh, showed that most Americans have a positive association with the word. So that's, that's amazing. The, uh, assassination or destruction of meanings and words was mentioned here in the previous panel by uh, one of the uh, persons in the audience. And uh, I, I'll say that, well, uh, this word hasn't yet been destroyed, hasn't yet been damaged to 55% of Americans. Uh, it's a positive word. But of course, 36% think that it is a word that has definitely a derogatory connotation or uh, meaning. So what do we do when we translate that word? Translating politics is always uh, difficult. So when the word is used um, uh, in a negative way, my personal preference is not to borrow the word into the Russian language, even using inverted commas. If the word is used negatively, well, I recommend uh, using uh, words such as leftist. In, in, in the Russian language, the word levak definitely has a derogatory uh, connotation. So when the word is used in a negative way, I would uh, uh, recommend that this word at least might be used or considered. But, but this is difficult. Translating politics is generally very, very difficult. I, do you have this on uh, the screen? Yeah. Translating politics? Yeah. Uh, it is difficult uh, because even ostensibly simple uh, texts that uh, a person might say, well, these are sentences that machine translation can handle very well. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> President Reagan, when he was welcoming to the White House Mikhail Gorbachev, 
said in December uh, 1987, today marks a visit that is perhaps more momentous than many which have preceded it, because it represents a coming together, not of allies, but of adversaries. And a very good uh, uh, software programs that I recommend to everyone if you don't know the language, uh, DeepL translates this is, uh, translates, it, it's, it's a relatively good translation, I would say it's a good translation, but the last word, adversaries, is translated by a Russian word that means enemy. An adversary in certain contexts can be enemy, yes indeed. In certain military contexts, yes. But the core meaning of the word uh, adversary is just, next slide, is just the other side. That is all, the opponent, the rival, the competitor. These words are in a way synonyms, but they are different. And their semantic spread in English and in Russian are quite different. So the word and, and my American colleagues had to grapple with that word uh, when they were preparing the uh, translation of Bretton Taylor's remarks. And uh, uh, they had the text. It was not an improvisation, it was a prepared text. Uh, Reagan, uh, in my experience, was very good at delivering prepared speeches. He was also sometimes very good in informal uh, discussions, uh, not always, but, but he definitely was excellent in delivering those prepared remarks. And so those who worked on those remarks, all those speeches, they placed a lot of meaning into every word, knowing that Reagan very carefully read those uh, remarks, uh, worked on his delivery, on his intonation. Every word mattered. And so my American colleagues, when they were translating it in advance, um, the first word that comes to mind when you have the American English word adversary is the Russian word pratinik. Pratinik basically is enemy, the foe. But they very correctly used a different word that is closer to I would say opponent or even competitor or rival. The closest using, they use the word saperniki. Saperniki. And saperniki is the closest word that exists in the English language is, I would say, competitor. competitor. It, it's what, sapernik is always the word that you use, for example, in describing, in Russian, in describing uh, a, a tennis match or a soccer. So, uh, what is the uh, English word that you might use here? Probably not adversary, and maybe not a competitor, rival, maybe. And so they used that word, and I think that was important because had they used the word protivity, that would have probably given a very bad impression to Gorbachev and the Russian delegation, the Soviet delegation. Probably could have resulted in at least some communication problems. So a comma can matter too in, in political translation. Um, let me just mention, it's very important, that when you take bilingual texts, you never talk about translation. For example, a treaty or a joint statement from a uh, Russian-American uh, summit or a Soviet summit both versions are equally authentic. The same in UN resolutions. Uh, because those resolutions are normally uh, developed or prepared based on the English text, very often people talk about the Russian or the Spanish translation of a particular resolution. That is not correct. It's not a translation. It's a version in Spanish of the resolution. And the English version, and the Spanish version, the Russian version, the Chinese version, the French version, those are the five official languages of the UN, have absolutely equal value. And when you uh, interpret them, you, uh, w when you try to explain your position based on the uh, uh, resolution, you can use the 
Russian text, the Spanish text, they are equally authentic. And certainly bilateral documents such as the uh, US uh, Soviet uh, statement, which I'm quoting on this slide, they have absolutely equal value. So in this particular text, you see that there is a comma after as required and uh, uh, which are permitted by the ABM treaty. There is also a comma in the Russian text and they are equally authentic. Uh, after this uh, uh, text, after this joint statement was approved, our American uh, uh, colleagues tried to interpret this comma as saying that all testing, all testing of ballistic missile defense systems was permitted, including testing in space. And they based it entirely on this comma, which they said, you know, there's a difference between restrictive and non-restrictive. So they said that uh, this is a non-restrictive clause. So we interpreted it very differently, that only those texts that are permitted by the treaty can be conducted in outer space. Only those tests that are permitted by the treaty. But in fact, the next slide, uh, it was the Soviet position that was right because you can interpret that comma the way you want. Linguistically, actually, that comma is necessary after as required. You cannot avoid the use of comma, whatever is the interpretation of that comma. In the Russian language, the comma means nothing, absolutely nothing. It's necessary grammatically. So we based our position not on the comma, not on the word which, katore, but on the text of the ABM treaty. And Article 5 of the ABM treaty specifically states that each party undertakes not to develop, test, or deploy ABM systems or components that are sea-based, air-based, space-based, or mobile land-based. So basically, space-based missile defense testing is banned by the So language can be a very tricky thing in, in political discourse and in political uh, translation. You have to be extremely careful, and particularly when culture-specific words are used when culture specific vocabulary is used because that vocabulary is very often used for damaging the reputation of countries, leaders, used for character assassination, can be aggressive, etc. So you have to be really very, very careful in this. And the final couple of slides are interesting because they show another interesting intricacy of political translation, of translating political uh, text. This is an example from the uh, translation of uh, a speech at the UN by Donald Trump in September 2017. It was translated amazingly, uh, interpreted simultaneously amazingly on uh, Iranian TV. They uh, thought that it would be a good idea to give a simultaneous translation to Iranian uh, audiences. And so there was an Iranian interpreter, apparently a good one, and most of the speech he translated quite well. But this particular phrase that Iran has turned a wealthy country with a rich history and culture into an economically depleted rogue state whose chief exports, exports are violence, bloodshed, and chaos, the translation as we translated from the Farsi, in our opinion, the Iranians could do better. Very little, or I would say nothing, from the original remains in this quote unquote translation. The next example, a very similar one. The entire world understands that the good people of Iran want to change. And other than the vast military power of the United States, that Iran's people, it, it's Iran's people, there's a mistake here in the slide here, that it's Iran's people uh, are what the leaders fear most. Well, the quote-unquote translation 
was something like the U.S. Army is a very strong army and the Iranian nation is a very strong nation. Well, some of the actual meaning remains, but very little. I'm sorry that I departed from uh, the character assassination and the use of derogatory language, but these are, and, and there are some other examples from the translation of that speech, it shows how politics can intervene in, in uh, uh, translation. It's interesting that the interpreter, as I said, uh, characterized by uh, his colleagues as a good interpreter, he had to explain, and this is how he defended his uh, translation. He said, I did not translate those remarks because first, these remarks were untrue. It certainly is not the function of the interpreter to judge uh, whether something said by the speaker is true or not true. Second, they were against my country and they were against Iran. And finally, he said, I think it, if it was anybody else, they would have done so. No, no. I, particularly when I worked at the UN and kind of the war, you know, the Afghanistan uh, invasions, other things, uh, you know, I had to interpret uh, some remarks that were very much against my country at that time, the Soviet Union, and whether I agreed with it or not, you have to give a faithful interpretation of what was actually said. So uh, language intervenes in politics, and that was the first part of my uh, remarks today. And just to show you an example of how politics can intervene in language and of course this second part is something that for a professional translator is totally unacceptable so uh that's what i prepared and before we jump to questions first of all uh, yeah. give a warm warm thank you for, for your time using this as uh, so open my my my, my power a uh, quick question uh you spent many years with gorbachev did he use uh, Bad language in, in official negotiations and talks with others and yeah and so how was it, was it often a rough language or or not that I remember actually he could be uh, a little rough when uh, there were internal discussions within the uh, Soviet delegation and uh, obviously particularly in the beginning of their dialogue. Uh, Gorbachev and Reagan often annoyed each other. Uh, Reagan began his first meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev by a diatribe against Marxism and Leninism. And it was not rough linguistically, but it was a real diatribe. And he said that, you know, Marxism and Leninism is the ideology that you espouse, and it has resulted in the deaths of millions of people on all continents, etc., etc. It was not rough linguistical, but it certainly, as Gorbachev mentioned to Reagan, he said, Mr. President, we have not come here to discuss ideologies. And that was a good way of, you know, kind of softening it. So he tended to, to soften. Sometimes he used uh, language that uh, was a little difficult to translate because he would sometimes use proverbs, he would sometimes use phrases that are uh, perhaps even specific to the part of Russia where he came from. Uh, but I, I don't recall you know, using the really rough language. Uh, during the first summit in Geneva, uh, he uh, kind of prefaced his reply to one of Reagan's remarks by asking him, you know, people who know Russian will understand, uh, by asking him, Mr. President, у вас есть лишние деньги? And this лишние деньги can be translated as money to spare. Mr. President, do you have money to spare? But it's a little rougher. And so I used, uh, you know, against my own recommendation never to exaggerate. I used, Mr. President, do you have money to burn? Uh, the meaning of it was that if you have money to burn, and it's better than actually using money to spare, if you have money to burn, then go ahead and proceed with your missile defense plan, with the strategic defense initiative. 
but we don't have money to protest. And so we will not do that. We will um, uh, not symmetrically respond to your uh, program. So I used something that was actually a little rougher than what Gorbachev said, but I think it was the right decision because money to spare uh, could have misled the, uh, the president. Uh, he, he would have expected the second phrase to be uh, uh, give it to us <laughs> money to spare. And that was certainly not Gorbachev's intention to ask for money, at least in that context. So, uh, uh, no, I, I don't think that I had that problem. Uh, actually, uh, Boris Yeltsin, uh, even though he did sometimes use Russian language, uh, um, you know, I looked through the records of his discussions with Clinton. And it appears that he did not use rough language in uh, negotiations either. So the fact that uh, rough language has been used in international negotiations, as I said, the rough language, uh, derogatory language is seeping into international conversations as well. But that, that is something that, as I understand, at least from the leaks that I've seen in the US press, that is something that uh, President Trump used quite a bit in discussions with Germans, with NATO officials, and some others. Uh, but no, at least in my time, I didn't have that problem. Thank you, thank you. Please, other questions? Your, your presentation has me thinking about this quote that's been said by a bunch of people about Donald Trump that uh, he should be taken seriously, not literally. Which I imagine would have to be a challenge for someone in your position attempting to <laughs> translate what he's saying at any given moment. Well, I, I don't think I don't think that there is anything in those particular phrases that, if taken and interpreted more or less literally, literally uh, would have been incorrect. So he should be taken literally and seriously. You know, mm -hmm. when he says things that are uh, uh, unacceptable to. Iran or to the Iranian translator, he should be translated as close to what he actually said as possible. And of course, any president of the US should be taken seriously. I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm wondering is like, to what extent, if any, does the, the sort of known personality of the speaker play in the job you were doing? Because you can imagine a world in which uh, Ronald Reagan, known for sort of being a, it, it's in some situations, the word jovial, lighthearted, uh, almost grandfatherly president, saying one set of words. Uh, and George H.W. Bush said the same set of words, uh, different sort of public persona in the eyes of many Americans. You might sort of react differently. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if uh, sort of, Based on who we know, based on what we know about these people and, and their, their, their public personalities, and that affects how the, the job plays out. Well, as translators and simultaneous interpreters, we really don't go there, but we certainly have certain expectations. I mentioned probability, inter, uh, probability anticipation as the main supporting factor in simultaneous interpretation. We tend not to hear things that are totally unexpected, that we did not anticipate. So definitely the interpreters, particularly those who are not translating from a prepared text, have to be ready that a certain president like Donald Trump could say things that could be either rough or uh, sound unexpected. You, you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared. How, how do you prepare? Well, basically, it, it happens in your mind. That that's the most difficult part of our profession. But you're right in the sense that uh, certainly the public persona of a particular speaker, of a president, is something that we should bear in mind as we prepare for uh, our work for handling a particular speaker. Yes. Um, uh, Rubio from Oxford. Um, a question about technology, if I may. Would you think that AI translation would make the problems that you were dealing with 
more significant or less significant? Well, so many things are currently uh, discussed under the label of AI that I really you know, don't know what, what to say. Uh, the, uh, uh, the particular uh, translation program called DeepL that I have mentioned here is, is a good one, but it does make quite a few mistakes. And this particular one, uh, you know, if used, could have had consequences. So I admire the progress of machine translation over the past 10 years. It, it, it has been unexpectedly fast, but I do think that ultimately the responsibility has to be with a human being and uh, all translations made by uh, machine translation programs have to be checked by a human being a and he or she has to be an expert, a real expert, because those uh, machine translation programs make both dumb mistakes and they, what I call good mistakes, this, this is a good mistake, you know, using the wrong Russian word is a mistake against the background of a generally good translation of that particular phrase that was provided by that particular program. Whether chat GPT translates better than DeepL, I don't know, but I doubt it. So at, at the present time, this program and a couple of others are the best that's available in the market. And I know that some of my colleagues, very good colleagues, actually use those programs. But they very, very carefully uh, then uh, check those translations, both for dumb mistakes that are immediately obvious and for mistakes that uh, actually uh, incorrectly reflect some nuance or some finer point in a particular sentence or text. So, uh, but, but again, even that I, I have to uh, kind of uh, say again that uh, I, I don't frankly know what is the difference between uh, the current state of AI and the current rather good machine translation programs. And again, I think that even if AI uh, makes greater progress than the current uh, programs, and, and there is a lot of work being done on the current programs, including Google Translate, including DeepL, but even those, even good programs do make stupid mistakes. As for final point, that will have to be checked, corrected by a linguist, by a human being for, I guess, at least a couple of decades to come, and maybe more. Well, more well, well, sort of thinking the other way around, really, which is that humans <laughs> make more mistakes. Humans definitely make mistakes, yes, absolutely. AI now is almost double uh, as accurate as a doctor in diagnosing serious cancers, for example. Uh, almost double as effective as spotting at uh, the stage. So it was really the other way around, I was more interested yeah. as to whether in fact the bias that you see yourselves having to inject into certain decisions, certain critical decisions about which words to use, I'm not so sure, but this is a particular thing where I'm not so sure because uh, the bias uh, is, is a word that I would not use. I would not use, you know, the, 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 the bias in the translation of this particular uh, interpreter was because of the country in which he works. Certainly AI would have done it a lot better, but uh, you, know, you have to have, first of all, perfect speech recognition uh, techniques, which are not yet available. You, I mean, there are many things that come into it, but this particular uh, bias is something that both uh, an AI or, or a machine translation program and the human interpreter would definitely avoid. It's the same thing. Whether, you know, uh, um, AI or machine translation will ever uh, work, like you say, 
comparing doctors and AI, whether they would ever work a lot better than, than a human translator, I'm not sure. But you're right. This, this is something that is evolving. And as I said, many of my colleagues already use uh, those programs, but they uh, uh, very, very carefully uh, check them. Yes? Um, we have a, a question from the chat um, by uh, Brandon DeLuna. Um, who says, uh, thanks for the interesting lecture regarding the impact of translation in character assassination. Um, I'm curious if there is an exploration on how curses or local colloquialism uh, were translated and communicated regarding a certain candidate. For example, um, if you look at the Philippine case where our erstwhile president, Rodrigo Duterte, is popular uh, in inverted commas for cursing the United States during his term. Well, uh, I don't know to what extent this was reflected in other countries, but I would assume that journalists, for example, who wrote about the Turkey, gave uh, a, a faithful reflection of uh, what he said. Uh, curse words are not that difficult to, uh, uh, to translate, but there may be problems, and I think that the professional interpreter or a good journalist will uh, definitely see those problems and the challenges and would uh, try to reflect the derogatory language used by uh, a speaker as best he can, he or she. You said the UN resolutions have uh, not translations, but several versions and Spanish of the resolution, but the resolution in, that is in English. No, also the resolution is in five languages and diplomats oh. in UN discussions are very careful when they mention other linguistic versions. For example, they will say my delegation will not be able to vote this particular resolution because the Spanish or Russian version of it is not yet available. So we are asking to postpone vote. That's the language that diplomats use very, very carefully. Okay. And for example, the famous resolution 242 of the UN Security Council, and that's about the uh, conflict uh, uh, after the Six Day War, as it is called. For example, again, in Russian, you have to be in, in translating into Russian. You have to be very careful. How do you translate Six Day War? In the Soviet times, they never translated it as Six Day War. They translated it as the Arab Israeli conflict of 1967. Uh, and of course, the word Six Day War is never used in UN resolutions. But the resolution 242 was adopted right after that. And it has that phrase withdrawal of Israeli uh, troops from occupied territories. And the French version has uh, a definite article, de territoire s'occupé. De means de le. And, and that's le is equivalent of the. Mm. But there is no the in the uh, English version. And there's been an enormous amount of discussion based on the fact that there is no article the in the English version of the resolution. What? Well, in many languages, articles simply don't exist. An article le exists in the French version, and so the French version, de territoires occupés, could be interpreted as meaning from all occupied territories. In English, the fact that there is no uh, uh, definite article has been interpreted as meaning that, well, there has to be a withdrawal from some territory. But actually, both documents are totally inappropriate because the does not mean all. The fact that there is no the in the English language yeah. means nothing because in the English version, sorry, in the English version means nothing because it's just one version of the resolution. The resolution has to be interpreted politically rather than linguistically. I gave you an example from the joint US Soviet statement, which our American uh, counterparts 
chose to interpret on the basis of a comma. Mm -hmm. A comma is a comma. You have to interpret it politically based on the ABM treaty to which the phrase refers. So very often language or translations are used in order to make political points. Mm -hmm. But ultimately it's, it's the political decision that has to be made. It's not made on the basis of words. I'll give you another example. In the Soviet times, when there were uh, two Germanys, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republics, when they became members of the United, there was a discussion of whether the Russian name of West Germany, Federativna Respublika Germanii, which Germanii is a genitive case, uh, whether it's correct, because in German, it's Bundesrepublik Deutschland. There is no of, there is no partitive, there is no genitive. So they said that the correct, the German delegation said that the correct name in Russian should be, translated word for word, should be Federal Republic Germany. And there was a big debate about that. And I participated in that debate because I was asked by the Soviet delegation to provide substantiation for the Russian name, the mm money -hmm. for the genitive case. So what could I do? <laughs> I had to find um, an explanation why it is used. And I found a couple of arguments in favor. There were certainly arguments against as well. But ultimately, this was decided political because Germany united. <coughs> and you know, as we all know, even before the Soviet Union broke up. And mm -hmm. so there was no question. It's from that mm -hmm. Germany. And uh, actually, you know, even linguistically, you can make a case for both, uh, for both uh, ways. For example, in early Soviet times, in order to avoid that problem, they uh, translated the Federal Republic of Germany as German Federal Republic. And it was GFR in Russian. So plenty of things, but ultimately these things are decided politically. And one day where I hope there will be a solution to the Middle East crisis, all those discussions of Revolution 242 will be totally outdated. Because linguistically you make all kinds of arguments. But ultimately it's Political solution. Yes. We've got five minutes, but please just, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, so this is kind of a broader question, not directly related to um, presentation, but um, in some ways, this kind of illiberal moment is a reaction to a certain kind of political language, like this kind of neutral, moderated, professional language mm -hmm. of the elites. Um, I agree. I absolutely agree. I think it's one of those things, particularly given. The, uh, I, I, I would say the, the fact that the political sphere has been inundated by people who never were interested in politics. And when they became interested, they saw that the language is kind of bland, neutral, that their own feelings are not reflected in the political language. So again, it's, it's linguistic, not just political here, right? Yeah, well, so what's your question? Me, yeah. Yeah, let me put you Whether I agree that. with you, yes, I absolutely agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what are the kind of risks you well the risks are the risks are of course tremendous both ways. If you neutralize it too much, then it's bland. It's something that people do not want, particularly the new people who have become interested in politics. On the other hand, there is, of course, a tremendous danger in the debasement of political language that we see today in many countries. So there are dangers both ways. And I, I think that, again, it all depends on the context. There will be periods in history of different countries when actually a more neutral political language will be required. But right now, politicians have to think about how to use less neutral language, but not to go too far. This may change. It's, it's not something that goes in a linear way in one direction. Question. Yes. Uh, how would you define the 
neutrality in language. I mean, if we look at uh, Turkey or Turkey now officially, Turkey has not been a problem until it was raised in Turkey that you should also in English use the Turkish spelling and pronunciation. Um, and then, then the problem was created over a fairly neutral name. And then, uh, well, my question would then be, uh, what is neutral? Like, the Turkey you, wasn't, you mean whether, whether uh, Turkey, Turkey wasn't meant offensive until it was made offensive by yeah, the Turkey. Yeah, right. Yeah, so. But it, well, that's domestic, problem. that's domestic politics. I think President Erdogan used it very effectively and for his own political purposes, that's domestic politics. Turkey never sounded derogatory to me and to most users of the English language. He used it for his own political purposes. Uh, as you know, the United Nations has accepted it. And now, you know, the plaque with the name of the country, both in the UN Security Council when Turkey speaks and in the General Assembly is Turkey. Uh, People, some people say that that was a, a, the wrong decision, that they kind of were led by the uh, Turkish president rather than taking their own decisions. Uh, but I think it, it was right in the sense that the UN is not imposing it on, let's say, newspapers, on uh, the media, they can call it Turkey or Turkey. But in order to diffuse to defend the issue at the UN, I think they took the right decision. So uh, obviously, you know, this is again an interesting nexus between language and politics, which is what my presentation was about. But, but of course, subjectively, you can endorse what the UN did uh, or reject it. You can say Erdogan was smart to use it in this way. Or you could say that this is political cynicism, you know, using something that is totally uh, inoffensive uh, in order to gain some additional popularity. Okay, yes? Actually, yeah, talking about political gameplay and character assassination, uh, President Biden just called uh, President Xi yes. Jinping a uh, dictator. And this right on the heels after this uh, latest visit from Lincoln, which was meant as quite reconciliatory or turned out to be so. What's your take on that? Does that make Biden, according to your slides, a, a liberal um, leader? Or, you know, what do you think was going on there? What's well, I, I never said, no, 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 I never said that that person who uses a uh, word that is uh, unaccepted, uh, unexpected, and perhaps unacceptable to many people. I never said that this automatically makes him a liberal, illiberal leader. No, I never said that. No, but no, also, no. of course, you know, Biden, as I understand, this was recorded and this was in an audience that was not supposed to uh, use the word publicly. He was, it was an, not an open event. It was an event with, where it is, with fundraisers, I think, or something, and it was, not a presidential address. It was probably a mistake uh, to use it because it leaked out. But again, even if you used it publicly, I don't think that this would make him an illegal leader. It's, it's not one or two uh, language, uh, one, one or two words that are used by a particular person, a particular leader that would make them illegal. It's, it's the repetitive use of certain words that could be a sign of illiberalism or could be just a sign of loose tongue. And um, I've watched Biden since 1974 and there have been some problems called gaffes in the media. Uh, since that, when I first came to the US in 1974 and he was a young senator and uh, the media would sometimes use his gaffes against him. That's been uh, a more or less constant feature of, of, of him. But this one was not supposed to be public. So not as much meant as the DJ rather about. No, I don't think that it, it is currently in his interest to use this word in a strategic way. No. 
the couples who joined maybe he forgot about it already. So. Yeah. yeah, could be. Well, I, uh, 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 our time is up, unfortunately. And uh, uh, Pavel, thank you so much for your wonderful, insightful, uh, quite uh, interesting <laughs>